Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. I have here three packages of VDPs that I ordered off eBay. I've already had a bad experience with them in the past, so I suspect that one or more of these might be fake. So let's do some investigation and figure out how many of these are real. While working on the Spectra Video 328 repair, I ended up with a faulty video display chip. It was a TMS9929A. So I went ahead and I ordered one from eBay, coming all the way from China because they're so much cheaper there. And when it got here, it didn't work. Bummer. Fortunately, it so happened that I was working on a repair series for the TI-99-4A, which happens to use the same video chip. So I borrowed it from there and I was able to finish the repair. At the same time, I requested a refund for the non-working chip I bought from eBay and I got it right away. Since I still needed one VDP, I went ahead and I ordered another one from eBay, thinking that it was just a fluke, but just in case, I chose a different seller. It was then that I was warned that the market for VDPs, especially the TMS9929A on eBay, was mostly made out of fake integrated circuits. Uh-oh, that doesn't sound good. I had heard of people getting fake or rebatched chips, but so far I was lucky not to have run into that. So just in case, I ordered a second one from a different seller. I figured they're not that expensive and I'd rather have an extra one for future repairs than get us stuck waiting for months again. And then, while I had those two already headed my way, someone recommended another eBay seller that usually sells original parts, so what the heck, I bought a third one. All of the packages have finally arrived, so let's run some tests on them and see if we can spot any fakes. So here they are, the three packages that we got from eBay with the VDPs. I haven't opened anything yet because I want to make sure we keep them very much straight. So as I open them, I will label them so we don't get them confused throughout the tests. And in addition to this, we have a couple more. This one, this one is a working one. This is the one that came out of the TI-99 4A. So that one is working. And then we have this one, which was my original order from eBay. And we determined that this is either not working or most likely just a fake chip. So this is patient zero, really. I'm just gonna do it right now. So let's call this patient zero. There we go. And then maybe for our tests, what we have here is the VDP that was in the SVI 328 with the heat sink that I can't even remove. So I don't know, we maybe we'll put it in some test to see what a failing uh, VDP looks like. That's what we have. So let's open these up and label them one, two, and three. So there is no confusion at all. Okay, so this is number one. The packaging is already not great. This is probably none of this is ESD safe. And this is a particularly, I've been told this is a particularly sensitive chip to ESD, elect electrostatic discharge. So this is number two. And on to number three. Another one, identical packaging. Wow, and there were two different vendors. All right, this is number three. Before we start, let's talk about this for a second. Why are people selling fake chips online? I suppose it could be like any other kind of good. Somebody's bound to try to pass a cheaper good for a more expensive one in order to make a lot of profit. But there are things in here that are not making much sense to me. So the first one is that these are not very expensive chips. They cost three euros with shipping to Europe. So, you know, even if the actual chip itself and the shipping is a total of one euro, there's not that much profit there unless you have huge volume, of course, which is point number two. Who is buying these chips today? Sure, I'm buying those, you're probably buying those, but I mean, it's not going to be thousands and thousands every month. I, I at least I don't think so. I don't think companies are buying them. So I don't understand that they're making huge profits from this. If this were like 50 euro chips, like maybe a Commodore SID, 
chip or the expensive WD-1772 disk controller, then okay, I understand that just selling 100 of those per month, it's a reasonable profit. But this doesn't seem to make much sense. And the third point is that as soon as you report that you got fake or non-working chips to eBay, you instantly get your money back. So they can't really be profiting from this. So I really don't understand what's going on. If somebody has some insight of why this is happening and how they make money, please leave me know in the comments below. I'd, I'd love to find out more about this. Here are all the VDPs. So this is the good one. I haven't marked it with anything actually even has the little white thermal paste from um, before. And then this is the one that we know for sure is not working, probably a fake one. And then these are the one, two, three ones that we got today. I mean, right away, you can notice that those two are identical. So even though they came from two different vendors, in theory, they can package exactly the same way and this exact same marking. So chances are they're going to be the same. They're either legit or not, both of them the same. This one is quite different. The lettering is more yellow and it's you know, smaller letters. I mean, they all have different letters, so that doesn't say much. And then this is the one that we know it's bad. Now, one interesting thing to notice is that most integrated circuits have this like this round dips. They're actually, I imagine this part of the manufacturing process. And, you know, this is a little shallow. You can tell that as you run your nail over it. When you look at this one, this is not shallow at all. This is clearly been sanded down and uh, re-engraved. So to me, that's, that's a clear sign that this is a fake chip. When you look at the others, this one is definitely, the shallowness is correct. It's, um, it's definitely, there's a dip in there. So maybe that wasn't sanded down. And then, Oh, interesting. So these two are very different. The, the dips are huge, but they actually have the Texas Instrument logo there. I never noticed that. That must be some kind of, um, I guess, protection to identify uh, legit chips, I imagine. Uh, at least if you try to send it down, chances are you're going to damage that, especially because they're fairly large. So either this is a very careful copy or very careful rebadging, or that's probably a legit one. And so is this one, which would be great. I mean, don't get me wrong. I would love if all of them are legit and I just had bad luck. After the initial visual inspection, what I want to do next is rub some alcohol on the tops because sometimes they're just, that's enough to see a bad chip if it comes out black or the lettering goes away. Clearly, I need to be careful not to do it on the part that I wrote. That's why I wrote to the side. But it seems that this one no, doesn't seem to get rid of anything and the cut and swap doesn't come out black. This one. And if you're hearing some noise, that's my wrist strap banging as I do this. Um, maybe it didn't come out obviously black, so that's good. It's a little grayish, but maybe that was just dirt. Yeah, I'll do it the other side. Like that. That seemed good. Oh boy, did that. Did some of the lettering go away? No. It's just very dull to start with. So as the alcohol was evaporating, I thought that maybe the lettering had gone away too, but yeah, these, these definitely don't go away. None of these go away with just plain alcohol. So let's move on to the next test. Okay, for the next test, I've come a little bit more protected because we're going to use acetone, pure acetone, directly on the tops, just like we did with the alcohol. Oh boy, I already got some on me. Good thing I have these gloves. Oh, wow, look at that. 
<laughs> that just went away. Okay, well, that confirms that that one was a fake one. What about this one? No, nothing. Cool. This. Nothing. And this, nothing. So, yeah, look at that. That's so very obvious. Wow. Yep. And this one, again, seems to disappear, but now it's just a liquid. So, well, those three, actually, the three that I ordered stand a chance of uh, being legit chips. Let's do some more tests on them and see if they actually work. Another easy test that we can do is to measure some resistances between some specific pins. In particular, I'm going to measure the resistance between VCC and ground, which are pins 33 and 12. Unfortunately, they're not the easiest pins to find automatically. And then I'm also going to measure the resistance between pins 40 and 39, which are the two that uh, function as that clock oscillator. So they they have to have some very specific circuitry right there. So let's start with VCC and ground. Okay, so between VCC and ground and with the um, positive lead on VCC, we get 670 ohms. Okay. And then those two are easy to find. The 249 and 30. And I'm going to put the positive of 39 just to be the same, 210. Okay. Now we'll, let's try this with number zero, which was our most likely very fake one that we erase some of the black parts. Yeah, that's pretty different. Before it was 670 ohms, here we have 19 mega ohms. Okay, in between these two was 6.8 mega ohms. Yeah, completely different insides. Okay, let's do the same thing with number one. So between 33 and 12, we're getting no connectivity at all. Okay, and these two, getting five meg, mega ohms instead of the 200 some kilo ohms. So that looks really bad as well. So now let's try with number two, which I'm kind of hopeful about two and three. I don't know, they just have a legit feel to them. Yeah, look at that, 700 ohms. So that's very, very similar to the first one. And then those two should have been like 200 K. There we go, a little under than the 220, but that's very close. And number three is probably going to be the same because they look identical. Yep, 700 ohms and 200K ohm. Perfect, so this is confirming that numbers two, two and three are good and probably number one is not good. But let's keep testing. It's also interesting to test the VDP that wasn't working, or actually that was working, but stopped working halfway through the repair. So we know this is a legit one that used to be fine. And then something happened mostly around the clock oscillation circuitry. But let's check to see if it has similar resistance between VDP and ground in those two pins. So yeah, between VDP and ground has a similar 700 some ohms. And between these two, oh, interesting. So that's 11 kilo ohms, whereas the other one was more like 220. So this confirms that something bad happened around that area of the chip and that it's not good anymore. Let's just do this to make sure, not like there's any other ones that have this heat sink. But that way I'll remind myself that this is not working anymore. At this point, it seems pretty clear that we have two fake VDPs and two that seem legit. So we could just put them on the computer as a next step and see if they work. However, there's a problem with that. Um, I still like to verify that the fake ones are not working. 
but I'm not crazy about putting them in a computer. Now we've tested probably one of the most important things, which is the resistance between VDP and ground. So if that was a short, really bad things could happen in the computer, but there could be other things that are shorted because we don't really know what chip is in there. So it's really not a great idea to put it in a computer that you care about because it could damage it. So instead of that, we're going to build a mini project to test the VDP in isolation. I first saw this project mentioned in the MSX forum. It's been worked on by a few people and the code and schematics are all available on GitHub. And I put a link down below in the description. The pins of the TMS9929 VDP have roughly four different areas. One is the crystal oscillator interface, just those two pins over there. Then the whole left side is communication with the CPU through the data bus and some control bits. And then on the right side of this diagram, of course, not of the real pinout, is the VRAM addressing and control. And the last area is actually the VRAM data bus. This VDP tester project uses an Arduino Uno to drive the VDP as if it were the CPU, and it has a crystal oscillator to drive the VDP clock signal itself. What's interesting is that it skips all the VRAM wiring. I first assumed that you had to have some VRAM hooked up in order to display any kind of video, but instead they use some of the different modes of the VDP to set some background colors and patterns without the need for any extra RAM. Obviously, this is not intended as an exhaustive test project. It's just something to check that the VDP responds to CPU commands and generates some signal, which is exactly what we want here. So let's go ahead and assemble it. Here's the Arduino Uno that we're going to use for this. This is the regular plain model and is actually really easy to program. All we have to do is connect it to the computer with a USB cable. So I launched the Arduino ID and all I have to do is load the tester program. So it's actually not very big at all. It's just a few lines of code. And we need to select the right board. So we have selected already is the Arduino Uno. And it's already selected to COM5. I think it detected it correctly. That's actually probably the hardest thing to deal with Arduinos in any computer is to make sure that they are recognized correctly when you plug them in. And we can compile this. We can verify this. Make sure that it works okay. Yep. And we can send it to the device. And that's it. We are set to go. So this like this is the VDP powered up with five volts and ground plus the crystal oscillator and a couple of capacitors. If we power this on, we could probably see whether the basic oscillation circuitry is working. Um, I'm not going to bother doing that because it, that could be working and something else could be failing. So we might as well do the whole project and actually get to see some video out. But if you're in a hurry, that would be probably an okay way to test it. Okay, we have everything wired up and yeah, I know it's a total mess, but this is not intended to be a permanent um, board. We just want it to last long enough to try all those different ones. I have it hooked up to the bench power supply and I have the oscilloscope hooked up to the luminance output for now, and then to ground over there. And we are powering both the Arduino and the um, 9929A to 9929 with five volts. And uh, as soon as I turn it on, we're gonna see, there you go. We see some output on the luminance, and this is exactly what it's supposed to be doing, is changing different screen modes and doing some vertical patterns. So very much the kind of um, output I would expect. So without digging any deeper, I expect this uh, chip to be working correctly. And we know this is the this is the one that actually was working. So let's go ahead and try it with the other ones. So we'll start with our zero, the one that we erased with acetone. Okay, all plugged in, let's turn it on, and we get nothing. We don't even get much current. Oh, there was a little something. Yeah, this is this is clearly not behaving the way it's supposed to behave. So 
This just confirms what we already knew that this one is not good. So this is number one, and this is more interesting because this is the one that we couldn't get anything weird with alcohol or acetone, but the resistance between a few pins was not what we were expecting. So I'm thinking this is not going to work. It's obviously very important to put them exactly in the same row, otherwise bad things happen. Okay, that looks like it's in place. And surprise, surprise, we get nothing. Yep, so that's another fake chip. And now for the grand finale, numbers two and three, which I expect them to behave the same way. And I have hopes that they work. Okay, let's turn it on. And yep, that's the that's the same pattern we're seeing with the good VDP. So awesome. One is working. And finally, number three. Hopefully this is just like number two. Yep, it looks the same. We get that little square wave pattern up above in the four voltage range. So awesome. We're going to try to display the luminance only on the TV. So I've just um, soldered a couple cables to an RCA jack, and we're going to hook this up to the luminance channel, and obviously this to ground, and then we'll display it as if it were a composite video signal. And if that goes well, it should give us a video without any colors, just pure black and white. So in this case, I'm hoping maybe we'll see some patterns and some changes in brightness. Also, I forgot to mention, I added this 420 ohm resistor between the luminance signal and ground just to lower the voltage before it was, I think, around the 6 volt mark or 5 volt or something. So this brings it down more to what's expected on a TV set. So let's plug this in. Okay, let's try this. And okay, we get a video signal, not seeing much. Not seen any changes. I was under the impression that this was supposed to change some patterns, although I suppose it could be changing colors and we wouldn't see. Oh, there we go. It just changed intensity. And it changed intensity again. So I think this is correct. We're just missing all the color variations that are happening right now. As an experiment, I've hooked up the other components to similar RCA uh, connectors. So the yellow one is luminance, and then we have red minus luminance and blue minus luminance. And since the TV doesn't understand those directly, normally there has to be a conversion process, I've hooked those up to the OSSC. This is the open source scan converter. So it takes the three component inputs in the back, and outputs an HDMI signal that goes all the way to the TV up there. So let's turn it on and see if we manage to get some color with this. All right, let's power it on. And there we go. Get some bright red. I don't know if those stripes are supposed to be there or it's just an LCD artifact. Now imagine it will cycle through different cut. There we go. So that's the intensity changes that we were seeing earlier. Huh. The image dropped out for a second. I wonder if that's part of the scan converter or something else. But yeah, it just seems to be going through different colors. Yeah, cool. So at least we got the color out in a relatively easy way without having to get into complicated circuits. So let's go ahead and try this with our suspicious number one. And power it on. We don't even get any power draw. <laughs> that should tell us everything we need to see right there. Yep, we get no signal, we get nothing. And finally, we can try the one that we know is working and we should see a similar color pattern.
Let's power it on again. And there we go, just like the other one. And now for the very final test, let's take the two VDP candidates and put them inside the SVI328 and that way we'll see it working fully inside the system and it should give us the correct signal and work as we expect. So let's give that a try. I'm very hopeful they're gonna work. Here we are, the VDP is empty because I was borrowing just one between this and the TI-99 4A, but the idea is to get one that we can leave here permanently. So let's try first number two. And we need to make sure we put it the right way around, so like that. Okay, let's power it on. And there you go, perfect. Yeah, 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 that's the keyboard being pressed. Okay, let's try the other one. Okay, that's number three. And let's try it. And perfect. Okay, so we got two good ones out of four. That's better than I was expecting, honestly. <laughs> There's one last thing I'd like to do before I put this back permanently in the SVI328, and that is to put some heatsink. This is a chip that oftentimes comes with a heatsink in many devices, and actually sometimes it doesn't. So it's probably not super crucial that it has it, but it probably extends its lifetime. But you can certainly turn it on for 30 seconds or a minute at a time like we've been doing it. I mean, it's not even getting particularly warm. But let's go ahead and put some heatsinks. These are not necessarily the best quality heat sinks, but that will certainly be better than nothing. And it's probably even better than this flat slab of metal that it came with. So this should be an improvement. Obviously when you do this, you need to make sure you have enough clearance, but this doesn't add very much and there seems to be plenty there. There we go, finally working. So the final tally is that out of the four VDPs I ordered from eBay, two of them were clear fakes. And that's important too. It's not just that they weren't working. They were maliciously disguised as a TMS9929A while in reality they were something completely different and probably much cheaper. And who were the vendors I got them from? There's the list. So if you're in the market for a TMS9929A or really any other IC for that matter, I suggest starting with the last two and skipping the first two. Interestingly, the last two were identical chips. They came packaged exactly the same way. And I even realized later that the picture they use on eBay is the same one. They would have normally triggered my alarm bells, but apparently it's all good. Maybe it's the same vendor with different names for some reason. Anyway, at least that seems legit. And it was also the one that was recommended to me in the forum. So I'm bookmarking those two for future orders. So what can you do about this? The most important thing is to realize that this is a problem and it's likely to happen with certain chips. I think maybe if you stick to mostly ordering DRAMs and very simple chips like that, you don't usually have this kind of problem. Although actually that's not true. I've heard of people getting rebatched DRAM that seems to work. It's just labeled as a higher speed than it really is supposed to be. So, But in general, I think the thing to do is to order from places that have good return policy or places that are trusted sources. And then the other part is to check your chips as soon as you get them home, because it's very easy. I know this because we have many projects going on at once and it's very easy to get chips and, oh, great, I got those. I put them in a box. And then two months later, you check them and, oh, they don't work anymore. And at that point, you may not be able to get your refund. So check them as soon as you get them if possible. Anyway, I hope you found that video interesting and you enjoyed that. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then.